My name is Anthony, and I will talk about um, deglacial climate modulated by the storage and release of Arctic sea ice. So the most common explanation for an ab abrupt climate change event is usually a land-based freshwater source that's draining into the North Atlantic during some kind of deglaciation. However, today we're going to explore an alternative uh, mechanism or hypothesis, that the growth and export of thick, multi-year sea ice out of the Arctic to the North Atlantic could cause a climatic cooling. I also want to note that what you'll see here in this presentation is that the Arctic can actually grow very, very thick sea ice, storing a massive amount of fresh water as a solid in the ice, approximately about 14 times more fresh water than, uh, uh, than the modern Arctic today. So some questions that we'll explore is, could the growth and export of thick multi-year sea ice out of the Arctic into the North Atlantic cause a climatic cooling? Is it possible to grow this thick sea ice? And if so, what is the equilibrium thickness? And what mechanisms could mobilize this thick sea ice out of the Arctic and into the North Atlantic? So I just want to go over our study area, typical LGM Arctic uh, scenario where the Arctic is uh, very cold and isolated from the global oceans, causing our simulated LGM ocean ice heat flux to be only one-fifth of the modern value. Now, like I said previously, I just want to reiterate again is that the typical abrupt climate change scenario involves a land-based freshwater source, source, but emanating from any of these outlets here that I've designated with the red arrow. However, what if the ice was already stored somewhere? It was stored in the Arctic Basin as a solid in very thick sea ice waiting to be released, possibly during a uh, warmer climate scenario. So there is, some, uh, there is evidence suggesting that the Arctic, during the LGM, uh, could have had very thick sea ice, such as low sedimentation rates in the Amerasian Basin in Lamanasov Ridge during the LGM, and low IP25 bio biomarkers suggesting permanent sea ice uh, in the central Arctic you know, over or greater than 84 degrees north uh, latitude. Now there's also some evidence, uh, observational evidence, uh, specifically from uh, Sir George Nares during the British Arctic expeditions in the late 19th century. He observed ice as thick as, uh, as he reported 15 to 18 meters between Ellesmere Island and Greenland what is now known as uh, Nair Strait. He actually ended up calling this ice paleocrystic ice, so we'll probably use this term a lot uh, during this presentation. Uh, more observational e evidence comes from explorers such as the Norwegian explorer Storker Storkerson, who spent the summer adrift a large piece of ice on the Beaufort Sea that he documented was 15 meters thick. Another really cool example of very thick sea ice is Fletcher's Ice Island, if any of you have heard that, or Ice Island T3, which was used during the Cold War by the United States Air Force as a floating Air Force base. Now, the uh, paleocrystic uh, ice causing a uh, abrupt climatic shift has basically uh, two phases. Um, this phase was hypothesized by Bradley and England in 2008. The first phase is the typical growth period, where you have a, an isolated Arctic basin. Uh, all the ice sheets are uh, cutting off any warm water making it into the basin. The only way in or out in this time is through the Fram Strait. <clears throat> when the climate warms, you get this export phase, probably some kind of interglacial, where you have the disintegration of the Barents ice sheet, you have warm North Atlantic water now able to flow into the Barents Sea, similar to a modern circulation regime. Sea level increases, it floods the Bering Strait, so now you have, uh, you have a f inflow from the Bering Strait into the Arctic Basin, and this could potentially uh, re uh, initialize a near modern ocean circulation and invigorate a very strong transpolar drift, allowing this paleocrystic ice to break up and be easily transported out of the Arctic into the, uh, into the Nordic Seas via the uh, East Greenland Current. So now we're going to test whether or not we can grow thick sea ice and can we mobilize this sea ice. And we'll use that with the MIT GCM. Uh, the MIT GCM is a coupled ocean sea ice free surface model and we've, we have forced it with CCSM4 LGM boundary conditions. We're gonna use two configurations um, in, this, in this talk uh, when I describe the perturbation experiments. I'll let you know which configuration. 
but we've used a 2.8 by 2.8 degree global grid, global configuration, and a finer one sixth of a degree, around 18 kilometer, regional Arctic configuration. And this configuration here is important to note that it is uh, eddy permitting, which means that the grid cells are small enough where it could um, uh, simulate uh, small eddy currents and any type of uh, boundary currents. So here we, we, um, we simulate our, uh, LGM, uh, our LGM environment, and we take this as our, obviously, our control uh, scenario. Now on the left here, this is our Arctic basin with the color donating, uh, den um, uh, denoting uh, sea ice thickness, with the darker colors being thicker sea ice. On the right here, you will see these two uh, representational cross sections of the Arctic from A, which is here, to A prime, which is here. The top one is the LGM, it's this configuration here, and the bottom is the same cross section, but our a modern ocean circulation regime. And it's important to note that the Atlantic layer, these shadings here are uh, absolute temperature. You can see that the Atlantic layer in our model is actually confined to outside the Fram Strait. It does, it does not make it through the Fram Strait. Unlike in our modern, the modern Arctic Basin, if you're familiar with the circulation, you do get warm water penetrating into the Arctic Basin below the halocline, and it kind of wraps around the basin. The, the fact that warm water can't get through the Fram Strait in our LGM simulations leads to an 80% reduction in ocean ice heat flux, which allows thick sea ice, specifically in the Canadian Basin here, to grow an average of about 26 meters. Along the north coast of Canada, we have uh, thickness values of greater than 40 meters approaching 50 meters. Now, all this sea ice here, we calcu I calculated to store about 14 times more fresh water compared to a modern Arctic. And I, I want to stress that, that the Arctic during the LGM can hold a lot, of, a lot of fresh water. Now spatially, um, 20,000 kilometers squared of Arctic contains ice greater than 60 meters thick, like I said, mostly in the Amerasian uh, Basin. And this is in agreement with some evidence of a sedimentation hiatus um, in this basin uh, during the LGM. So I just want to point out real quick that on the left here, you have area of sea ice in kilometers squared versus thickness. Uh, so it's the thickness value and the area that it takes up in the Arctic. And I also want to note that on the right side here, we have uh, velocity versus thickness. Um, basic uh, scatter plot. Basically what this is showing is that the ice in the basin is very stagnant. It moves less than 75 meters per, per year because the, ice, the basin is pretty much isolated. Um, the thickest sea ice, is barely moving. You can see this here, greater than 40 meters is barely moving. But you see this here, I circled this. Now this sea ice is closest to the Fram Strait, which makes it um, uh, a little thinner and easier to mobilize out of the Arctic. So that's why you have values um, that are uh, higher over there. So now that I described to you what our LGM Arctic looks like and the thick sea ice that we have grown, I want to talk to you about the perturbation experiments that we induced in order to see if we can move this sea ice quickly out of the Arctic basin. So first, what we did was we, um, we tried changing atmospheric conditions, such as uh, 10 meter wind or changing the wind stress on top of the ice. So what we did here, um, I just, uh, the first row here, the blue line is the control, and the blue line is the control here. The red line is our perturbation. So we did a wind pulse of 10 meters per second, which is very fast, once every 10 years for one year. So you can see these spikes. So a perturbation the first year, perturbation the second year, and only lasts one year. The first spike here is very high. It's about 0.2 sphere drops of uh, sea ice, because this is when the, um, the thickest sea ice is transported out of the Arctic and into the North Atlantic. And the subsequent spikes after that are a little less. Each of these spikes is roughly comparable to a uh, glacial uh, Lake Agassiz uh, outburst. Um, the second, in the second row here, this is the change in Nordic Sea salinity from the control. So it's perturbation minus control. And you can see that which, with every wind pulse, there is a Nordic Sea salinity uh, decrease, which is also associated at the bottom here with a decrease in AMOX strike. Um, I also want to point out that each successive pulse here seems to get a little stronger, if you can kind of see that, it's got a slope here. And uh, we're still, I'm still looking into this, but it may be, it may be, uh, 
a, uh, some kind of ocean preconditioning where every time you have a pulse, the next pulse allows the AMOC to weaken at a stronger magnitude than the last one. Now, um, this is a continuation of the wind experiments. Uh, I did a, uh, another two quick wind experiments. I want to point out that this green line is the start of a perturbation. This red line is the end. So what I did was I did wind pulse of five meters per second. I did a wind pulse of seven and a half meters per second, uh, denote, uh, denoted by the colors here. And um, for the interest of time, basically both, uh, each of these wind pulses last 50 years of sustained wind. And um, uh, each wind pulse basically uh, has a Nordic Seas salinity decrease and an AMOC decrease. But for the interest of time, I won't go into too much detail. Next, we did a Bering Strait open. We opened the Bering Strait to try to invigorate a near modern ocean circulation to see how that would uh, uh, work with sea ice export. Uh, this is the same as figure one. You can see the LGM controls at the top, Bering Strait is at the bottom. So when we open the Bering Strait, we do get Atlantic water penetrating between 500 and 1,000 meters depth, causing warming of around four degrees C, and, and, a, and a five-fold increase in ocean ice heat flux. So this is very significant. Uh, this causes a reduction of mean sea ice thickness, about 20%, and destabilizes sea ice for transport. And you can see here, uh, at, this is the Fram Strait sea ice export with opening the Bering Strait. Year zero is when we open it. Around year four, there's a delayed response. We get a sea ice pulse of around 0 0.095 sphere drops, and it decreases, and the discharge gradually decreases to steady um, and remains higher than the control integration. And in about 25 years, we transport about 50,000 kilometers cubed to sea ice out of the Arctic um, with a uh, freshening of the Nordic seas of two sphere drops. And lastly, I want to talk about um, how we tested whether a outburst flood from a glacier could actually mobilize sea ice, an outburst flood originating from the Mackenzie River in the Arctic, and if that can flush sea ice um, out of the Arctic. We used our high resolution, uh, one sixth of the degree regional configuration for this, and we released a, um, a flood of five sphere drops. So here's the results to this. Um, I want to point out that 85% of the discharge that we have uh, observed here ends up in the East Greenland current. At this resolution, you can see that. So at day 112, you can see that the sea ice, uh, the colors here represent uh, the perturbation minus our high resolution control. So it's the difference. You can see that sea ice begins to uh, transport out through the East Greenland current. By day 158, the sea ice has made it all the way down to the Denmark Strait. And by day 257, almost a year later, the sea ice has made it around the southern tip of Greenland, where it begins to melt in the Labrador Sea. So after three months, we get around a 0.5, uh, sorry, excuse me, 0.4 sphere drop transport, uh, transporting ice as thick as 12 meters. Uh, it's also important to note that in about one year, we get, we, um, uh, this flood transports 4,500 kilometers cubed of fresh water via, uh, as ice, which is roughly half of the uh, one year glacial lake Agassiz outburst flood. So to conclude, our results offer a compelling alternative mechanism to the widely cited terrestrial outburst flood. The Arctic is likely to store significant volumes of fresh water as ice and superimposed as snow. And I'll get back to this in a minute. Mobilization happens in multiple ways. We can change atmospheric circulation. You can have a change in wind. Um, sea level rise, the flooding of the Bering Strait, uh, creating a near modern ocean circulation. Or perhaps there was an outburst flood, possibly originating from the Arctic, that helped transport that ice um, via uh, water flow. In, e in each case, though, it's important to understand that in each case, significant volumes of fresh water as ice was discharged into the Nordic Seas, supporting an Arctic trigger for events such as the Younger Dryas. And I use this example here because if the ice is already stored, uh, excuse me, if the fresh water is already stored at ice, we would have barely any sea level rise, but still see a situation like the Younger Dryas, where it's been noted that there's uh, little sea level rise during this period. Thank you, and I'll take any questions. What happens to your Arctic Ocean salinity with that um, large amount of sea ice? Um, the salinity, it's, it, it's a little salty um, at the intermediate depths, uh, not by too much, but a little bit. And I think that has to do with a lot of brine rejection when you're growing that much sea ice. So yeah, there is, it, it does get a little salty at the intermediate depths, yeah. A little bit above, above average. Thank you. Great.
Hello everyone, my name is Siri and I'm doing my PhD at the University of Vigo on coastal pal environments. Today I'm going to talk about the effects of the late glacial and early Holocene climate change on these particular and complex environments, which are the Galician Rias. The Rias Baixas are shallow environments, protected coastal bays located at the Atlantic margin of northwestern Iberia. The studied Rias in this work are the Ria de Rosa and the Ria de Vigo. They comprise shallow sediments, which are very interesting to obtain sedimentary records for part reconstructions because they are very sensitive to North Atlantic climatic chains, and also they are close to the boundary between the Siberian and the Mediterranean regions. This is one of the rias at present, and in this work, our main objective was to characterize the main climatic shifts occurring during the late glacial and the early Holocene and affecting these ecosystems, therefore filling the gaps that existed in the coastal area of northwestern Iberia. Two sedimentary sequences have been studied. They come from two cores recovered in shallow sediments of the Ria de Vigo and the Ria de Rosa, recovered at 30 and 54 meters depth, respectively. Uh, we performed a multiproxy analysis on the two sedimentary sequences, including palynology, mainly pollen and dinosis, also lithology, grain size distribution, carbon distribution, and chronological analysis. Here I'm going to focus on the uh, late glacial to early Holocene transition sequences. Chronology of the two sequences has been provided by radiocarbon dating, pollen stratigraphy, and comparison with other paleoclimate records. Here I show you the radiocarbon dates obtained along the Rosa core. The sequence comprising the late glacial to early Holocene uh, transition comprises the period between 14.2 to 9.4 kilo years BP. In the Vigo record, the sequence studied here comprises only the early Holocene and goes from 11.4 to 7.5 kilo years BP. Well, from pollen diagnosis and uh, lithological data, we have it described seven major regional zones. The first zone is characterized in the bottom levels of the Rosa record and comprises the period of the late glacial interstadial. These levels correspond with uh, sandy mud, with the scattered shells, and woody fragments. And low DP ratio values would uh, indicate, well, the DP ratio is dinosis to pollen concentrations ratio, and indi would indicate a shallow environment with high, st high terrestrial inputs. The dinosis record, uh, I wanted to point out Lingulantinium macroforum, which is a species indicative of warm waters and strong stratification of waters. Its scarcity in the Rosa palynological record would indicate uh, uh, weak stratification of waters and probably is related to uh, cool conditions of what, um, the waters. Uh, the pollen record also supports cool climatic conditions reflecting a more or less open landscape with high representation of grasses and cold tolerant tree species like betula and pines. However, uh, well in general we cannot infer major changes in the vegetation from the pollen record during this period, the late glacial interstadial, but combining pollen, dinosis, and also other sedimentary data, we had identified uh, several minor changes in the coastal conformation and the relative sea level, which may be related to uh, several climate substages during the late glacial interstadial. Then we have identified three short cool phases, characterized mainly characterized by increasing values of Selenopenthes guanta. This is a dinocyst species related to cool environments and nutrient-rich waters. These phases also coincide normally with increasing proportions of mud, fungal remains, and some types related to freshwater environments, typical of the upper levels of the marsh and swamps. These three phases also uh, correlate with increasing values of some types which may be considered sherophytes. Well, we interpret that these three phases, apparently cooler, would be, related, would be related to lowering of the relative sea level in the coastal area. So the swamp and the upper levels of the marsh are closer to the sedimentary point. Therefore, its representation increases in the pollen record. On the other hand, these three phases alternate with other three stages of increasing values of some types uh, considered halophytes, like Enopodiaceae, which are typical of the lower levels of the marsh. These three phases, apparently warmer, would be related to an increase or a stabilization of the relative sea level, 
when the, when the increase of the accumulation of space of the for the sediments in the coastal area would favor the expansion of the intertidal area and the allophilus area in the coastal, in the coast, uh, corresponding to the lower levels of the marsh. Well, in general, these results would evidence that uh, the ecosystems of the Ria de Rosa have been sensitive to the succession of several climate substages during the late glacial interstadial, as it has been described in other sites of northwestern Iberia in the highlands and also in isotopic records from Greenland. While the next zone, regional zone 2, represents a period of lower sedimentation rate in the Rosa record, corresponds with the phase. This phase corresponds with the stage of a strong sea level decrease already described in the region from seismic and other sedimentary data. Accordingly, in the Rosa record, we can see lower DP ratio values coinciding with the marked decline in the tree pollen, although percentages of betula are still significant. We interpret that this phase includes both the younger dryas and the 11.4 kilo year event. However, because of the low, sorry, the low uh, sedimentation rate, the resolution is not high enough to uh, define the limits of these two events. Regional zones 3, 4, and 5A are, are recorded in the two sequences studied, and they correspond with the early Holocene. Regional zone 3 suggests an increase of temperatures marked in the Rosa record by, the, by a decline of Selenopenthes quanta, the increase of pollen from mesophytes, and the decline of some cold tolerant tree species like Betula. In the Vigo record, this phase is characterized by the increase of deciduous forest dominated by Kirkus, uh, representing an impro a climatic improvement. Regional zone 4 represents another cool stage, short phase, uh, characterized in the Rosa record by a new peak in Selenopenthes quanta, a decline of some mesophytes, and the increase of some helophytes or cold tolerant species like pines. In the Vigo record, this phase is characterized by lower DP ratio values, an increase of some uh, helophytes or cold tolerant species like pines, betula, and carpinus, and also uh, an interruption of the Kirkus expansion. This phase is dated to, sorry, in the marine realm also we can see in the Vigo record an increase of Bitectatidinium, which is a dinocyst species indicative of lower sea surface temperatures. Well, in general, this, these two phases are dated to around 10.5 kilo years BP in the two sequences studied. And it might be the expression, regional expression of the bone cycle seven, already described in other European paleoclimatic records. Next, we have the regional zoom A, which, uh, which represents in the Rosa record a strong increase in Erica CI pollen, coinciding with the decline of cold tolerant tree species and uh, level sediments, uh, coarser sediments with uh, higher content in bioclast and a strong DP rate increase. All of these indicating clearly an increase of the relative sea level. After that, we can see a significant increase of Kirkus pollen, but this uh, only occurs after 10,000 years BP in the Rosa record. However, in the Vigo record, we can see uh, the first significant increase of Kirkus pollen no later than 11,000 years BP. This could be explained because in the Rosa record, the regional pollen signal may be overshadowed by the local development of several unstable environments like streams, ponds, coastal headlands, etc., related to an increase of the relative sea level and precipitations, and particularly by the high representation of coastal headlands with its high pollen production and dispersal capabilities. The regional zones five and six in the Vigo record represents a period of high environmental instability uh, marked by strong fluctuations in the pollen abundances, higher content in gravels, and that's all. During this phase, we can identify two short cold periods, mainly characterized by increasing values of helophytes or cold tolerance, and, yeah, and uh, the well, an interruption of the Kirkus expansion. One of these phases that dated around 8.2 kilo years BP seems to be the most intense, characterized by a significant decli decline of deep rate values and a peak of bitetatodinium tapicense. While these two phases seem to correlate with the well-known abrupt climatic events, uh, 9.3 and 8.2 kilo years BP, already described in other sites in northwestern Iberia. Two minutes. Sorry. Okay. 
the last zoom represents the final expansion of Quercus, uh, coinciding with the decline of cold tolerant tree species and a strong increase in the DP rate of values. Uh, also, an increase of the values of Lingulodinium macroforum would be, would be related to an increase of temperatures, relative sea level, and precipitations just after the 8.2 kilo year uh, abrupt event. Well, to finish, uh, our main conclusions uh, were that the studied ecosystems, the Rias Vichas, have been sensitive to the major climatic change occurring during the late glacial and the early Holocene, and uh, including those substages during the late glacial and the also, we have described for the first time in northwestern Iberia a cool climatic event, short phase, uh, dated to around 10.5 thousand years BP. Thank you very much for your attention. Can you use the relative percentage of the different dynasts to come up with like an estimated temperature um, through time uh, at the site, or is it more reflecting the changes in, for instance, the sea level or um, ecosystem changes? Sorry, do you mean if I can use the relative dynasts of what? To come up with like a, um, an estimated temperature. So like if you... Yeah. Well, we also have concentrations, but I didn't have the space to show them. And, uh, for example, in the last phase, uh, when we observed this strong increase in relative abundances of lingulotinium, for example, and other uh, mesophytes and thermophilus indicators, uh, we also observed an increase of uh, concentrations. Uh, but, uh, well, I, I think uh, we can associate an increase of relative abundances of some mesophyte species, floristic species, or maybe uh, warm indicator species in the marine realm with an increase of temperatures also, if they correlate with other proxies and mantra proxies. Thank you. Jen? Uh, I'm going to talk today about an idea we've had recently, and that was to compare a series of uh, charcoal records, of high resolution charcoal records, uh, from northeastern Europe and central eastern Europe with uh, uh, rapid climate changes which occurred over the whole scene and to see if there are uh, certain differences. I'm going to give now a little bit of background on rapid climate changes. Uh, I'm sure you all know that there is enough literature showing that the Holocene has been uh, characterized by a succession of uh, climate shifts, which were of centennial scale to multidecadal scale duration. And these climate shifts are known in the literature as rapid climate changes, or RCCs. These RCCs overlap the bond events, which were shown to occur with periodicities of 1,470 plus or minus 500 years. So I illustrated uh, the rapid climate changes of the Holocene, how, they, how uh, uh, they were identified in the previous studies. I illustrated them on the N-GRIP uh, oxygen isotope record and on the solar activity reconstruction. These rapid climate changes were generally uh, associated with, mi with minima in solar activity, and they were characterized uh, particularly in the North Atlantic area by uh, temperature drops, I mean they were mostly cold events, and they were also characterized by, uh, decreases, uh, by, in by decreases in moisture in the extratropical area. There are uh, a lot of studies showing a relationship between these rapid climate changes and various proxies or various paleoenvironmental comp components. However, uh, the relationship between fire activity and rapid climate changes is understudied. And this is because uh, there is a need, uh, in order to do that, uh, we would need a high resolution uh, record of the proxy based on which fire activity is documented. So we have uh, five resolution charcoal records, which are located in uh, Central Eastern Europe and Northeastern Europe. Four of them are macro charcoal records, and one of them is micro charcoal records. They're high resolution, on average 20 years per sample, but uh, uh, there are uh, time intervals where this re uh, resolution uh, considerably increases. And these are uh, mainly la lakes and bogs. We have, uh, if I can, yeah, show this. Is this the laser, the pointer? Do you know which? Hmm, huh. hot. <laughs> so, but I can do it this way, okay. It will be better. Uh, so we have uh, five sites, lakes and bogs. Uh, one of them, Lake uh, Lielais Svetinu, is located in uh, eastern Latvia. 
It is a, a lowland lake uh, located presently in hemiboreal uh, forest. The second lowland lake we have uh, uh, we have it in the, in the lowlands of Transylvania, it's Lake Stuci, presently located in the forest uh, steppe ecotone. We have two lakes located in the Paisia Abies conifer forest, uh, that is uh, Tolmucet in the eastern Romanian Carpathians, and Mulhashul Mare in the western Romanian Carpathians. And we have also one site located in the Timberline ecotone in the eastern Romanian Carpathians. Based on these sites, we have these uh, macro and micro charcoal records, and by relating them with the periods of the uh, rapid climate changes, we try to answer the following questions. Firstly, we wanted to see if there are changes in burning patterns, and if these changes in burning patterns are associated with the RCCs. And then, if there are changes in burning patterns associated with the RCCs, are these changes burn, uh, in burning region specific, are they site specific? And then we move a step further and try to see whether this variation in charcoal records is random, or if there are periodicities, and if these periodicities overlap the periodicities of the bond events. And uh, to talk a little bit about the methods we used, we used mainly uh, charcoal analysis. Macro charcoal we, uh, was used as a proxy for local fire activity, whereas micro charcoal for regional fire activity. Macro charcoal represent charcoalized particles, in our case. Uh, larger than 150 microns, whereas microcharcoal particles between 10 and 150 microns. Uh, both macro and microcharcoal particles, in order to give, to give a little bit of background, we have uh, a conceptual scheme about charcoal deposition and transport and deposition. Both macro and microcharcoal are produced, uh, can be produced within the same fire event. But uh, this fire event can occur inside the catchment of a depositional environment, outside but close to the catchment, or more distal fire event. And these charcoal particles, both macro and micro, are transported uh, at a certain distance from uh, the fire based on their size, based on their shapes, shape and taking into account a series of other factors. And uh, of course, their morphology is uh, quite different, as you can see in these uh, pictures. Uh, we have these fire, uh, these charcoal records. We initially had them as uh, charcoal concentrations, but ba based on the deposition time extracted from the age depth models, we transformed them as accumulation rates. Uh, age depth models are published, but we also used other published information, such as past vegetation dynamics, past human impact, and local climate uh, reconstructions, all these being independent. And to test the periodicity in our charcoal records, we used a uh, statistical uh, a spectral analysis, which is specially designed for paleo data and evenly spaced in time, such as our case. Uh, now I will try to answer the first two uh, questions, namely, if there are changes in burning patterns associated with the RCCs and if their pa these patterns are region specific and or site specific. Our charcoal, charcoal records are in black, black line, the uh, lowermost part, the uh, half, bottom half part of uh, of the figure, whereas uh, the top part of the figure are the N-grip oxygen isotope record, the NEO index, index reconstructed, and the reconstructed solar activity for comparison. And now if we add on the figure uh, inf information on uh, vegetation, past vegetation and past human impact, uh, we can see that some big changes in fire activity uh, basically is related to some big changes in vegetation. For example, the, the bottommost site is the site located in northeastern Latvia, Lake Svetinu. Around 5,000 5, years ago, there is a huge increase in fire activity, but this, this actually coincides uh, with a change from uh, temperate deciduous broadleaf forest to boreal forest. And then a decrease in the last millennium of fire activity, which is actually associated to an opening of the landscape. The lowland site in central Transylvania, central eastern Europe, uh, where we have uh, high fire activity, we also have open woodlands, and in the middle Holocene, where we have low fire activity, we have more closed woodlands. And then we have the two sites in the conifer for a forest belt, Toul Muced and Molhashul Mare, and uh, they have been located all along, all their, uh, their history in the conifer forest belt in the conifer forest, Paisia abies. And during the last millennium, when there is increasing human impact and increasing landscape openness, uh, fire activity is also uh, higher. And finally, the Timberline site, Poyana uh, Stol, there is a huge decline in fire activity around 6,000 years ago, but this also coincides with the lowering of timberlines and tree lines. So a timberline 
sustaining. And if we add on these trends, if we add the intervals of, ra of rapid climate change, and if we further, yes, if we further add uh, the climatic information from uh, local reconstructions, uh, red arrows dry, uh, blue arrows wet, we can, we can see some patterns in, uh, in our charcoal records. For example, for the early Holocene uh, cold events, we can see that generally during this, these events, fire activity decreases at all sites in all regions with the exception of the 8.2K event where fire activity is contrasting. For example, in the nor northeastern Europe site, there is a huge increase in fire activity overlapping some drier conditions. Whereas at the other side, there are uh, uh, decreases in fire activity or moderate fire activity. For the mid Holocene, there are generally decreases in fire activity. Yeah, and uh, for the late Holocene, for the first part of the late Holocene, the same thing decreases in fire activity overlap con uh, contrasting climate reconstruction. But, but for the late Holocene, what is interesting, there are some contrasting patterns in fire. For example, the two uh, climate uh, events, the medieval climate anomaly and the little ice age. During the medieval climate anomaly, there are decreases in fire activity in the lowland sites, both in Central Europe and Northeastern Europe. But there is increase in fire activity in the conifer forest site. Uh, and this is, based on the published records, this is uh, mostly due to human impact plus biomass availability, fuel availability. And now if you go to the third research question, to search for periodicities in our charcoal records, we use the red feed spectral analysis and for the first site, the site Liela Svetinu, located in eastern Latvia, northeastern Europe, we can see there are some statistically significant uh, peaks statistically significant periodicities over the 95 and 99 uh, confidence intervals. And these periodicities in this case are between 6,000 and 3,000 years. And there is another peak, peak at 1,100 years. And with, if we go to the other lowland site, this one located in Central Eastern Europe, there are also several statistically significant periodicities. At 6,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, there is actually one peak with two well, between six and 4,000 years, and another peak uh, at 1,350 years, and uh, uh, several smaller peaks. And for the conifer forest site, there is a peak with, uh, which shows periodicities between 1,500 500 years and 1,000 years, which are statistically significant. And finally, for the uh, timberline uh, site, there are other peaks statistically Two significant. Minutes. Yes, I'm, I'm finishing, which show uh, periodicities of 3,400 years, of 1,300 years, 900 years. And what we can see is that at all four sites, and also in the case of the microcharcoal uh, site, not shown here, these are are all macro charcoal. There are similar periodicities which overlap the periodicities of the rapid climate changes and bone events. So if we go now to the conclusions, we have seen, we have found periodicities in, at all sites which are statistically significant and which overlap the periodicities of the bond events. And uh, in what concerns the behavior of fire activity during these intervals of rapid climate change, there are episodic reductions in burning. Uh, around 11.2K, 10.3K, 9.4K, 5.2 and 6K, and 4K. But there are uh, rapid climate changes characterized by contrasting patterns in fire activity, such as the 8.2K, the medieval climate anomaly, and the Little Ice Age. And for the, sec for the last two events, medieval climate anomaly and Little Ice Age, the contrasting patterns were shown as uh, to be enhanced by, by uh, human activity. And thank you so much. So the, the periodicities that you see um, that are similar, do they, they don't necessarily occur at the same time, though. So once you remove exactly. out, and so, so is, does that then make sense linking them to the bond cycles? Yes, it, will be, it would make sense. But with uh, this, what I presented is preliminary statistics. We need to find a way to use a statistical method which uh, does not introduce, which is suitable for, for our data, which is unevenly spaced in time, in order to show when these periodicities occur. But uh, we are still thinking was the, the best statistical method to use to, to see when those periodicities occur. For now, we have just found that there are periodicities of that time frame, and they coincide with, sorry, and that's all. And yeah.
Buenos dias a todos e todas. I first have to acknowledge this convenience to invite me as the last abrupt event of the session. And then I have to, for the first time of my life, reveal the real title of my talk, because you only get the second line of the talk. <laughs> and so the real title is to analyze the impact of a partial melting of Greenland ice sheets on vulnerable areas as a cell to see the impact on population and health. And the third thing I have to do on this first slide is to acknowledge a real transversal pluridisciplinary teams, kind of dream teams, led by Dimitri de France, who was a PhD in our team for two years. And you can recognize, I think, some names can, of people that are experts on housing experiments or Heinrich events on this line, but there is also people that maybe you don't know that are experts on statistics, experts on impact on agricultural uh, problems, and also on climate migrations. So all together, we made a paper that will be soon published in NASA that I will show you. And the last one is a specialist on pathogen vectors, and I will also give you a little bit of that at the end of the talk. So we will go through all this, and I think in 12 minutes, and then I hope we will, uh, can discuss a little bit. So where do we become from? We, we, we come from this. In fact, this is the framework of our study. I just showed this figure, which is very, very well known, because it's a figure of the synthesis of the IPCC, just to stress the point that we are in the two, 2017, and we are on the RCP 8 by 5 which is the most realistic, unfortunately. So I think it's quite important to, to, to think about it and to think that from this consensus that we have in the IPCC, we can go to make some research on new frontier. And as you know, the climate is something which is very complex and in which there is many, 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 many uh, processes and some of them are really breaks and nonlinear and also there are some thresholds that makes the system quite complex. And as you know, there are some complexity and thresholds and nonlinear response in carbon and climate system. For instance, uh, in the partitioning of the CO2, which is not always the same, in the fact that you, you can have big feedback positive loop in permafrost at short term, at short term, and in clatterets at longer term. But here I essentially want to show you what could be the major instability and interaction between cryosphere and climate that could lead to something new that we have not explored yet. So I will first focus and be interested to know why is it interesting to study um, superimposed to the RCP 8.5, which is the most realistic. Why is it interesting to make new experiments and to explore the new frontiers on cryosphere stability? And this first plot, you most, most of you know this plot, it's, it's a plot that shows the deglaciation since uh, 30 kilo years. And you see there that during deglaciation, you get a fresh water, which is about 10, 10 millimeters per day of increase in sea level rise. But you see that this is absolutely not a linear processes and that you get some burst and you can get four times more than the average during deglaciation. So deglaciation was not and will not be linear processes, that is for sure. We also know, thanks to paleoclimate studies, that when ice sheets are vulnerable, and this was the case of Laurentide ice sheets, you have from time to time Heinrich events. This has been beautifully documented by Odell and others, many, many people, and this morning you can, in this session, see that it can be also computed by uh, models, uh, by Uwe this morning. Okay, so this is something we know, we know that it is possible to have abrupt events due to the cryosphere. And we can discuss about the mechanism later. And the third thing, is there any hints of something happening more recently? So we get this disappearance of the Larsen, the Larsen ice shelves. And uh, this is very important because the Larsen ice shelf by itself doesn't produce any sea level rise, of course. But as it, 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 it is a bustressing uh, feature and it helps the ice, the ice sheets to, to exist when it disappeared, of course, it increases the number of icebergs and then it contributes to, to, to sea level rise. And because of that, 
working with uh, Jorge Alvarez Solas some years ago, we designed new scenarios for explaining this Heinrich Evans through ice, uh, through ice self melting. And this is what happened uh, in the Larsen Bay, not Heinrich, but a disappearance very rapid of an ice sheet that has for consequence to increase the icebergs in the uh, Antarctic Sea. So for all this reason, we decided to make a series of experiments. So as I shown you on the second transparency, the, the baseline is the RCP 8.5. And from that, what we did, we did three series of experiments. One where we increase the sea level rise from now to the, the end of the century by 0 0.5 meters, one meters, 1.5 meters, and three meters, either from Greenland all alone, or from West Antarctica alone, or a mix of both with 1.5 for each. And we do that, we would do this simulation, so we make a kind of very simple e experiment where we put a fresh water from the year uh, 2020 to 2070, and then stop. And the constant uh, sphere drop is 0 0.11 for 0.5 meters, 0 0.22 for one meters, and so on. And we, we did that for in three scenarios, Antarctic, Greenland, and both, and I will only present today the first scenario, which is from Greenland. Then, before going to my own result, our own result, I should say, I want to make a tribute to Paolo Clement. Very often you hear this uh, very, very common sentences. We will try to know some, something from the past to project for the future. But here it's really what was then done. I mean, we, we, I, I, I show this tribute to Stefan Mulitza's study in 2008 because it's, it's a study where you can get both modeling and data. It's a paper where you showed beautifully that when you get a, 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 a melting and you decrease the AMOC, it has very strong influence on the North Africa and Western African monsoon from data and modeling. And in this year, what you see, it's a the difference between weak amok and strong amok, when there is a melting of the, of the Laurental ice sheets, what does it produce on the tropics and especially on the Western monsoon, the Western African monsoon? And so what you see here is a large, large decrease of, precip of net precipitation on the plot number A. And you see also this is clearly linked with the change in atmospheric uh, processes through the, the sea level pressure and, 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 and the wind. And this is also producing changes in summer temperature and winds, and of course, it impacts drastically the transport of moisture. This is a panel D. And this is linked to the fact that when you pour a lot of icebergs in the North Atlantic, you drastically change the atmospheric circulation, you push southward the African monsoon patterns, you drastically decrease the monsoon in the Sahel area, and you increase the jet and spread the jet. And all this is beautifully shown in this paper. So we are doing something different. We are doing a transient experiment during this, this century, putting water from the year nine, uh, 2020 to 2070. But if you looked at the interaction between, no, between North Atlantic and Western and, and Africa, so you can see that it's quite instantaneous and it's also due to the, <coughs> the atmospheric changes in the tropical area. So what I show you here is the uh, is, uh, evolution of the AMOC in our four experiments, 0.5, 1, 1.5, and 3 meters. And you, you see that, like in the previous experiment, we decrease drastically the AMOC when increasing, okay, this is what we expected, and then I show you only the 1.5 meter experiments, because it's much more simple, but it's still true uh, above one meter. All the features I will show are also true above just one meter. So what we see here in terms of temperature, you see that we change the temperature pattern drastically over, northern, over Western Africa, and we also change, of course, as for the Mulitza experiment, the sea level pressure and the winds. And I show also that we also change the summer temperature uh, uh, and the summer monsoon. But the most important thing for me and for us, in fact, is the impact on hydrology and especially on precipitation. And so this second plot, 
is a plot where we, where we are looking on the Sahel region, which is between 8 north and 18 north, and 70 west and 15 east. On this box, we are looking to the changes in precipitation. So this is the anomaly in precipitation normalized by the precipitation of the RCP 8.5. And what you see and what is really important is that if you do such an experiment of housing, you get a response which is a drastic decrease of precipitation, especially in, in summer. And so that means that the African monsoon is drastically affected and this has severe consequences on first um, population and then health. Before going to that, I want to show you the evolution of this precipitation during our simulation. Two minutes. Okay, for the four scenarios, and you see that you get a drastic decrease, which is increasing, of course, with, with, the, fresh, with the fresh water increase. And so this is a very important result. Why? Because if you look to the IPCC and you look to the chapter on African monsoon, you will find this figure. It's a quite complex one, but you can only look at the RCP 8.5, which is important, in red. And you will see that when you increase the CO2, the response that you get in these 32 models can be intensified or decreased, change or not change. You can find everything you want. But if you change, as we do, uh, if we melt a part of the Greenland ice sheet superimposed to the RCP 8.5, what you get is a drastic decrease of the Western African monsoon. Now, the, the, the other panel shows you what happened then. What happened then is that because of that, you are under the threshold of sorgo and millet, and a lot of the agricultural area is lost. And this is very important because you lose a lot of agricultural area and you're obliged, and this is a curve A, uh, and then you oblige, uh, this is another calculation, you oblige all this population to leave. So the curve B is accounting for that in present day demographic with uh, the two, two 2011 situation. But if you, if you account for the scenario of the future, which we have to do from the SPS3 of the IPCC, then you can see that you get 10 millions of people that will be obliged to move. Okay, so um, in conclusion, for this part, I would say that con contrasting with the result of the IPCC, where, where you just increase the CO2, when you account for a superimposed partial melting of Greenland, you can drastically change the tropical dynamics and oblige a lot of people to move just because they are dependent of the monsoon and the monsoon will change. Now, to finish with a kind of optimistic touch, I can show you something about health. So what, now what I'm working with somebody called Cyril Caminad, he's an expert in Liverpool on pathogen vectors. And as I show you in these experiments where you melt part of the Greenland, you change drastically the tropical hydrology, not only in the Western Africa, also for the Enso and also for the, the Indian and Chinese uh, monsoon. And so it's quite interesting to, 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 to show that Doing that, you will also change the colonization, not only of the man, but also of, of the pathogen vectors. So as a last transparency for this session, I show you the result that has been uh, obtained by Cyril, and here he is only using the scenario of the RCP, different scenarios, and he is looking for the spreading of the malaria in Africa. And as you can see on this plot, what is very important is that the malaria spread to islands in Eastern and Southern Africa. But as I told you, the RCP changes are very weak compared to our, our changes in Africa. So what we will do with Cyril, we will use our simulation and show what does it make for the, for the dispersal of these pathogen vectors from malaria, but we can do it for many, many pathogen vectors and try to explore these issues together. Thank you for your attention. If you move the, the place of where you form the, the, the maximum production of deep water in the North Atlantic, for example, north of uh, Iceland or south of Iceland in the Labrador Sea, would this make a difference? I am not sure I, I, I get the question. I'm sorry. If okay, I'm moving, moving the, the location where 
uh, uh, the maximum production of deep water occurs ah, yes, in the yes, North yes, yes, Atlantic yes, yes, from yeah, north yeah, to yeah, south. Yeah, yeah. Okay, how would this yeah. in fact, have what we did, the model? Yeah. What, this are the first series of experiments. So what we did, we want to get a, 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 a we want to get a, a big result. So what we did, that's sure, it's also described in the paper, we, we, we put the water in the most favorable region. But, but it's, it's, it's realistic, I mean. But we could also, as you said, change the inputs of the fresh water and we, we, we will have other results. But I think this first series of results is, is quite reasonable. But you're right, uh, we, we, we decided to, to put the water for, for Greenland, but also for Antarctica in the most favorable places where we know we will change, more, 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 more importantly, the response of the ocean dynamics. Thank you, Ray and Heinz, for inviting me to give this talk. And the way I've structured the talk is I'm going to talk, I'm really, hopefully this is okay with the two guys in charge, that I'm, um, I'm going to give you a bit of an introduction to the Holocene and try to set the mood for the next for today and then into tomorrow um, and hopefully set up some speakers uh, and their talks to sort of discuss um, policy and climate change at large. So I'd like to thank my co-authors, um, in particular two of the postdocs that are out of the, um, out of the two groups, uh, Jeremiah Marsitek and Cody Rouston, um, who uh, Jeremiah is with me at the University of Wisconsin and Cody is working with Daryl and Nick at uh, Northern Arizona University, and then our co-author, Jeremy Shacken. Um, and then I'd like to, uh, now that I'm at the University of Wisconsin, I'd like to just thank Lou uh, and Fung for uh, a lot of data, data conversations, data model conversations, and really uh, taking me in to think about modeling in the Holocene and what goes into models and how we can do better data model comparisons going into the future. Okay, so um, I thought about this last night and I added these slides in. Uh, maybe this is a philosophical question for myself. So why do we study the Holocene? Um, is it because of the abrupt climate change events? Here they are for our brothers and sisters who work in the Pleistocene. Here are our abrupt climate change events that we study. Not so much. Here's our little 8.2 event and here's the rest of them. Um, is it because the signal to noise ratio is, is pretty good, just like through the DO events? Here's a reconstruction that I made. Uh, you know, that's 73 data sets that have been Marley Carnot simulated. Well, is it because the data model agreement is so well? This is the data model agreement between uh, uh, Jeremy Shacken's work and some of Lou and Fung's work for the last deglacial. Here's our data model comparison across the Holocene. Um, and I'm sort of joking here in, in a way, but this is important to me. Um, and here's the way the models have agreed, and the data have agreed over the last deglaciation, and now, for some reason they've diverged. Uh, another question you could ask, why do we study the Holocene? Do we just enjoy suffering? Sometimes I wonder. Maybe for us as Holocene people, Pleistocene issues are just too easy. I mean, you have all of these DO events. They all look the same. I shared an office with this guy, Christo Bowser, for so long. It's, if you talk to him long enough, it's just a seesaw. <laughs> of course, I'm kidding. Uh, there's actually lots of things going on during the Holocene. This is from Heinz's work from 2008. And this is pretty surprising. We have, the forcings aren't that big in the Holocene. The, there's insulation changes. CO2, though, doesn't do much. There's some volcanic activity going on. Yet, we see large changes going on in the Holocene, and that's very interesting. This is the, one of the reasons why I think a lot of us study the Holocene. Mountain glaciation. I, I'm, I do a lot of glacial geology work. This is Tiedemann Glacier in, at Mount Waddington. This, is T, uh, this glacier extends for about 20 or 30 kilometers. What you're looking at here is the glacier itself, and these are the little, little Ice Age moraines. And to give you some sense of scale, those little Ice Age moraines from the base of that glacier to the top it's about 200, 200 meters higher. And this glacier is thought to be 200 meters thicker only 150 years ago. So important things are, and very significant things are happening during the Holocene. 
We also studied the Holocene to understand the spatial patterns. That's probably one of the bigger things that, uh, that's coming out of this, the pages 2K syntheses. This is some earlier work by Michael Mann, uh, looking at just the Little Ice Age and the medieval warm period. But this is a big area of, uh, a big question for us is what are the spatial patterns that are going on? Not just the mean, the mean state changes. We also want a lot of things that are an area of interest that a lot of people are working on now, like Thomas Lopley and Peter Hybers, are the variability changes and how that changes uh, across the Holocene, and then also how those changes compare to, uh, to the models themselves. Right, and I mentioned this before, and this was mentioned at the, in the plenary uh, talks at the very beginning, is we also are, were interested in the Holocene because of mean state changes and even the trends. So there's a lot of things going on. For me, the reason why, at least, I think we're interested in the Holocene at some level is that we live during the interglacial. And uh, <clears throat> the Holocene itself is a relatively stable period of the last 20,000 years compared to something like the, the, la the last deglaciation uh, uh, plotted here. So this is just a compilation of Jeremy Shackens and I stacked, just slapped together with the instrumental data set put on just for a a comparison. We, human civilization has existed through this interval, and here we are here, and this is our projections into the future. And what's going to happen? And the Holocene is very important in, in this context because it's, it's all the variability, all the human experience has happened through this interval, and this is where we're about to go. Right, so today we're disrupting the balance. This is just the energy balance sort of summarized into four panels, increased we can do it by increasing any one of these or decreasing it. We can change the global energy balance. Today, we decided to play with this knob here. And because of it, we've, we've seen this as the instrumental record here from the IPCC reconstruction, either decadally averaged or annual, if you like it. But the point is, is that we have a strong warming trend occurring. And the reason why we study this, and this is why it's, I think all of this is important for geologists, is the instrumental record in the grand scheme of things is tiny. I put a little line here, this is being generous. What you're looking at here is this little blip here and, and some of this is the instrumental period. Geologists provide the context. This is the last 20,000 years. Modelers per give us information, uh, climate modelers give us information about what, what might come depending on the emission scenarios that we choose. This is just a simple schematic that came out of a paper that we co-authored with uh, Peter Clark uh, last year. So these are all reasons to study the Holocene or to, to study uh, climate in general over the last 20,000 years. Um, but we have some problems. In particular, the Holocene, there are some, some issues that are going on. And for those of you who were here earlier in the week, Lou gave a nice talk about uh, the Holocene climate conundrum. And uh, if you haven't heard of it, what, that, what he means by that at least is when we worked earlier on uh, through the last 20,000, or through the deglaciation, the Holocene, or sorry, the deglacial and modeling uh, results from the trace model agreed very well. But as we moved into the Holocene period, there became a divergence between the proxies themselves. And these proxy records more or less haven't changed. They're the same ones that we use for the, for the glacial or the deglaciation, and it's the same exact model, but there is a divergence here. And this is what Lou's called the Holocene climate conundrum where the data want to make an early Holocene warmth with general cooling, and the, the models want to have a, a general warming throughout the, entire, uh, throughout the entire Holocene. And why does this matter? Does it matter? I think it ma it's very important that we, we have this mismatch, but I also think there's a lot of opportunities there. Here's just a, a, a histogram of our, of our data sets, the model and and the, um, and the proxies. The blue here is what we had in our 2013 paper. This is just the, the histogram of, of all of this data for the Holocene. And here's, just for reference, this is the first century of the, or the first decade of the, of the 20th century and, and the last. Just to, and what, the reason why we plotted this is we wanted to think about are we outside of what's normal. And we concluded that we statistically couldn't tell. However, if we were wrong, as it's been suggested that these, the, these data are very much a summer uh, biased um, reconstruction, and that if the model's right, then we've left what we think is, is the normal. In fact, if you look at the histogram of the models here, you get pushed back enough that we've, we've left sort of this, uh, this uh, maybe normal space, you might want to call it. And it's not just the trends. 
where we're having these issues. The, this is work by Thomas Lopley and, and Peter Hybers. This is, the, this is a power spectra diagram here, so period and years uh, going this way. This is the data. This is the power spectra of the data for magnesium calcium in, in UK37, and here's the models. And there's a divergence not only in the trends, there's divergence in the variability that's being uh, recorded in the proxies and the models themselves. So, uh, in 2013, we published this paper with uh, 73 data sets from across the planet. Um, and basically, I just mined out all the existing data, temperature data that we, we, we could find and gave it certain criteria for what we would do, uh, for what would be included in this, this reconstruction and what wouldn't. Um, and we came up with these plots here. So this is the last 2,000 years, and this is the last 11,000 years. So time on the left, time's going from uh, the right to the left here. For the last 2,000 years, the reconstruction, so the reconstruction that we did is in blue, with the purple line being the mean, and then the gray here is uh, Michael Mann's reconstruction. Um, and we show pretty good agreement over the last, over the last 2,000 years, which gave us some confidence of, the, of reconstructing the, the data set further back to 11,000 years. But there's problems even in this data set, which we acknowledge in the, in the publication, which is this long-term trend, and I'll scoot back one here, this long-term trend here that you see is largely being driven by these records in the Atlantic, in the Atlantic Basin. And he, so here's all of the records together binned in 30-degree bins, all on the same scale, and you immediately see this rec these records here. And these are the UK 37 records off the, off the east coast of the United States. If you actually, if you remove the North Atlantic records, and I'm sorry it's so small here, the, the gray here is our reconstruction, and the red is if we just remove those records. So in, rather than giving this long uh, downward trend, it actually will flatten it out. Now we have no reason to remove those records. We, we included them into the reconstruction because it's part they are a data set, and there's no viable reason to throw them out. But we did note in the, in the publication that if, if you remove those records, you'll just flatten it. However, this doesn't solve this conundrum. This is something Lou and I have talked quite a bit about. That would only essentially get you a flat line, but we don't get this upward trend here, and we still wouldn't get the agreement that we, uh, between us and the models. So therein still lies an issue. There's some other data sets to consider. When you think about all this and that we're not in our reconstruction at the time and that we didn't compare to, this is uh, work by Yair Rosenthal, and these are from benthic foraminifera um, from the Pacific Ocean. And um, so these are their reconstructions here. So this is at 500 meters and 600, 900 meters. And interestingly, these are benthic forams living in um, the water that's, that may be well mixed and you wouldn't think have, is seasonally biased. And they're also getting these long-term trends, similar to what we were getting in our data sets. It, our data is also consistent with work. This is a, um, a review paper by Tapio Schneider, who's just looking at ITCZ changes over multiple, um, multiple time periods. This is his reconstruction um, based on the Carriaco cores. Uh, this is their ITCZ proxy here. Time's now going from right to left. Here's our... our um, northern Hemisphere minus Southern Hemisphere um, reconstruction here and agrees pretty well with what you would anticipate from the IPCC record. But again, this mismatch still exists. This is, a, 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 I think, an opportunity for the community to attack and to try to uh, get to the reasons why. Is this a data, as Lou put it, is this a data, is this a data problem? Is this a model problem? Are they both are both uh, the proxy and model need help to, to get us uh, uh, to this match? There are other questions about why these, why it matched for the deglaciation and why it didn't match here. There's a lot of opportunity. So where are we going? Our, this, our group at, uh, with NAU as well as is, uh, my group at um, uh, Wisconsin. This is some really nice work by Cody Ralston, who's a, uh, the postdoc working with Daryl and, and Nick. These are, uh, now they've added several hundred more data sets to this database that they've been collecting over the last uh, two, to, two to three years. And here are just some of his reconstructions now binned by uh, latitudes here. And if you look at the data, you still see some of these long-term trends existing, even as we've added more and more data sets to this, um, to this big compilation. 
And so my, my postdoc, Jeremiah Marsicek, is also contributing to this data collection effort. Um, he's now um, added in about another, about 900 pollen reconstructions into um, Cody's uh, database, and now we're in South America trying to resurrect what I would call dark data, but essentially data that exists on CD drives on people's, um, uh, in people's closets that have um, gone dark, and so he's trying to resurrect some of these old data sets and bring them into this database. And we're going to store them all as uh, Excel spreadsheets. Just kidding, in case Julian's here. It's all going into Linked Earth so that no one ever has to do this again. And you can just go, and eventually the idea is that we'll have all this data there to mine yourselves, and you don't have to believe our reanalysis. You can do your own. And this will be, uh, again, freely available. Julian already set this all up. And this is a growing database that we're contributing to. So thank you. Good afternoon. I slightly changed the title of my talk, Holocene Climate Variability, Understanding the Multiscale Dynamics. And um, main problem or the main motivation I have here, if you look at the time-space domain, you see there's kind of um, linkage. So larger the phenomenon is, like global scale, AMO, or <coughs> ice ages, the longer the time scale is. And uh, this is usually true if you have really dissipative systems like atmosphere, ocean, but this is a question mark. Is there really a true relationship of spatial and temporal scales? Um, and um, I like to uh, start with SST data. So if you look at the last 7,000 years, we see a lot of variability, but the most promising thing in SST data is a trend. If you make a plot of the trend onto spatial um, on the globe and compared with models that look like that. So at high latitudes, you see a cooling trend and at low latitudes, you see a warming trend. So here the model and the data seem to be consistent. I will show you in a minute that's not. Um, namely, if you make a um, diagram, um, on the x-axis, a reconstruction uh, trend and on the y-axis, a model trend. I mean, it has a, ha has a slope, which is good, but the slope is not on, is not on the one-to-one -one line. So um, the models, also on the right-hand side, uh, you see all the PMAP models, which are available at that time. Um, they have also the same problem. So all models seem to underestimate the temperature trend and uh, compared to proxy data. There's another problem. So this is the amplitude problem, I call it. And we have also, I call it the Pacific problem, because if you look in the, in the North Pacific, uh, the models tend to have also cooling, but the data seem to be have a warming. Um, so another view, so PMAP2, PMAP3, if you do the ensemble median, the greenish colors show a cooling trend, the reddish warming trend. So um, what we did, uh, we uh, run a high resolution model it looked quite different, actually. Um, uh, you see uh, the third panel, you see the pronounced cooling trend in the North Atlantic, and in the North Pacific, you have a warming, cooling, warming trend. So kind of heterogeneous pattern, um, unlike in, 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 in the other models. And if you even downscale uh, the system, so even higher resolution in the ocean, we see even more complex uh, structures and um, I will go to into detail about the structures. Zooming in into the North Atlantic and North Pacific, you see at least here the amplitude seem to match somehow. So we have patches of cooling in the North Atlantic, which is um, reconstructed by Alkanon data, met maybe not the right location, but you see at the western boundary current, also in the upper right panel, you see the velocity in this high resolution model has really is very narrow and you see there's really strong gradients if you go to high resolution modeling instead of going to the usual climate models. And the lower left you see the North Pacific heterogeneity and it's also quite different to, uh, to the other models because we, ha we have really warming, cooling, warming trend and you see also the data on top of it so we really see uh, that we can uh, provide a heterogeneity in the data if you have a higher resolution model. 
So what's the reason for the heterogeneity in the North, North Pacific? It's relatively easy. It has something to do with the atmospheric bridge coming from the tropical Pacific to um, a northern high latitudes, the PNA pattern. So if we have a kind of a tendency for um, PNA plus, that means we have a heterogeneous pattern in, in sea level pressure and also then in uh, sea surface temperature in, in winter. In summer, it's more boring. It largely follows the insulation. So we have basically the answer that it's uh, not uh, true. That we have a persistence, a, a persistence of jets, atmospheric dynamics, and in the ocean, we have western boundary currents, we have sea ice effects, and so on. So that means um, the, um, there is no relation, or uh, we have um, a small scale structures even on long time scales. Um, if you go now to variability, if you make uh, plots of variability and spectrum and how they look like, so a large data set here, and uh, basically you see basically red noise process. Yeah? So the best can be um, explained by the red noise, by the Hasselmann model. So dt dt is equal to minus lambda t plus forcing on the right hand side. And I will try to convince you that um, the underestimation of the trend has also something, is also reflected in the variability. So this red noise um, model is, I think, the um, first order approximation of the climate system. And if you see um, the spectrum, the red noise, if, if on the right hand side we have a white noise forcing, then we have the response in the temperature is this red noise uh, spectrum from Hasselmann. And um, you can see it in this way, or you can see it in the other way, that we have a perturbation of the system. So the same equation is used in, in climate model runs. If you have the function f, which is the heavy side step function, you increase um, um, uh, forcing, like CO2. And then you can make the ensemble mean, so in the brackets. And then you have an easy exponential function. And basically, the climate sensitivity is then given by delta t is equal to C over lambda. So basically, the lumber is the same in the spectrum as well in the climate sensitivity. So um, another way of looking at climate sensitivity is to look at climate spectra. Or in other words, climate variability during the Holocene is, uh, uh, provides you another measure of climate sensitivity and then automatically falls out that the climate sensitivity is time scale dependent. So it depends when, whenever you have kind of this spectrum, you can uh, directly relate this to the climate sensitivity of the system. So therefore, it's not also not astonishing that the models tend to underestimate the, the trends, but also underestimate the variability. So this is the same uh, graph as, as shown by the previous speaker from, from Tom Leple, um, that, that the upper graph shows the spectrum coming from the data and the lower graph fr from the models so it's an underestimation of the variability, which is in line with the underestimation of, of the mean trend during the Holocene. So this provides you maybe a kind of a common framework uh, to give you an approach for climate variability and sensitivity in the system. So um, finally, what, what kind of processes are probably missing in climate models? And this is one particular example here. Um, the one particular example is blocking. So blocking structures, so persistent structures of high pressure in, here in this case in the North Atlantic are typically not well resolved by climate models. This is an uh, example here uh, where it is resolved because it's prescribed. And this is an ocean um, ice, ice, ice model. And you see whenever we have um, high um, sea ice export from the farm straight to the North Atlantic. So the upper uh, panels so in the upper years, so here's a time going from 1950 to 2000 roughly. So the uh, red um, years, we have um, a high export of sea ice coming from the Arctic Ocean. And uh, the bluish years, we have a low um, sea ice export. So whenever we have a high sea ice export from the Arctic Ocean, we have um, more blocking, um, but not blocking around Greenland. Uh, this prevents sea ice coming from, 
from the Arctic Ocean uh, to the North Atlantic, uh, but we have uh, um, a high blocking activity of the coast of, of um, Spain and, and, and the North Sea. And this provides a linkage of um, um, long-term variability in sea ice export from the Arctic Ocean um, coming from, and, and this affects also the AMO, basically it's driving the AMO, so the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation is driven by the, uh, the long-term uh, modulation of the synoptic activity. And um, I think the reason why the climate models completely underestimate the variability is that they don't have um, enough blocking in, in the models. It's too zonal, and, um, the, and this has other consequences. If the models are too zonal and have not enough blocking activity, so blocking, by the way, is so one example is this omega shape circulation in, in the northern hemisphere. Yeah? Whenever we have such circulation, we have also more extremes. We have a warmer climate than coming to, to Greenland and much colder climate to, to Europe. So basically, the type of blocking is also related to, to the extreme events. So once we have um, um, not uh, correct um, statistics of the blocking in the models, we also have problems, of course, to deal with extremes, uh, cold extremes over Europe. Okay, this is one example why I think um, um, there's, there's a clear indication that we need higher resolution um, and that the long-term and the short-term variability are highly re related. Okay, so uh, my last slide, so the Holocene climate variability. Um, the spatial and temporal scales are not, there's no uh, simple relationship. So we have on the long-term trends, we have um, very um, high resolution um, uh, spatial gradients. So especially the role of the western boundary currents in the ocean, but also atmospheric dynamics. And, um, and in, in, the, in the last slide, I also um, uh, indicated there might be also uh, missing variability due to uh, not enough blocking in the atmosphere. And this causes also um, the wrong statistic of extreme events. So I guess as um, um, future direction, we need uh, this higher technology, more advanced observation, more uh, climate data, and of course we have to use um, that uh, the more higher resolution climate models in order to understand um, the feedbacks in the system for long-term um, variability. This is also important for uh, this kind of fundamental question, and we need, of course, also better theory for that. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon. So yes, my name's Elena. Uh, I've just started a PhD between the University of Bordeaux in France and University Laval in Quebec. The preliminary results that I'm going to show you today on behalf of everyone who worked on this project fall within the general uh, questions relative to the evolution of Holocene climate uh, in the Northern Hemisphere. More precisely, uh, our study focuses on the post-glacial opening of a strait of northwest Greenland. The strait in question is Nez Strait, uh, which, celebrate, which separates sorry, Ellesmere Island in Arctic Canada from the northwest coast of Greenland. So other than being a gateway for fresh water, which controls and influences convection patterns in the Labrador Sea, Nair Strait also supplies the North Water Polynya with nutrient-rich Pacific waters. The North Water Polynya is an area of open sea and it's one of the most productive areas in the Arctic region. The existence of this Polynya uh, in Baffin Bay is entirely dependent on sea ice conditions in Nair Strait. During the last glacial maximum, Nez Strait was filled by uh, grounded ice, uh, which cut off uh, this connection between the Arctic Ocean and Baffin Bay. The strait is actually situated on the former confluence of the Greenland ice sheet with uh, the Inuitian ice sheet, which covered Ellesmere Island and most of the Canadian Arctic archipelago. Uh, the retreat of uh, ice sheets in this strait 
And uh, finally, the opening of the strait re-established this key connection in modern oceanography between the Arctic Ocean and Baffin Bay. But because of harsh sea ice conditions in the strait, uh, paleoceanographic investigations into its history are relatively scarce, and the crux of the scientific knowledge lies only upon a few marine cores in the north and in the south of the strait, and most of the evidence is land-based with uh, continental outcrops and lake core studies. So uh, the current state of the knowledge is unable to provide a um, integral um, a, a Holocene history for the strait, hence my current research project, um, which is based on a set of three marine cores in the north, south, and center of Nair Strait. And today I will be showing you the result from core AMD 14 King 2B, which was collected in Kane Basin, uh, Central Nair Strait in 2014. This core is really unique in that it's the only core to have been collected in the center part of the strait to contain a continuous Holocene record uh, since the initial ice sheet retreat. The chronology of the core is based on a set of four, uh, 14, sorry, of nine 14 sea dated um, mollusk shells and benthic forums, which provide a solid uh, chronological frame for our core. This is uh, particularly important in the earliest part of the Holocene, uh, since there are many uncertainties relative to ice sheet retreat and the complete opening of the strait. One challenge that we face uh, in this region is the lack of knowledge concerning reservoir ages. So throughout this talk, I will be using uh, ages that were calibrated with a DR of zero, but uh, in order to compare our studies, uh, or our results, sorry, with other studies, we uh, are aware that we do need to take um, the variability in, of reservoir ages that may be applied in other studies into account. And here we have, a plot, plot, here we have plotted um, the ages with a DR of 335. So I will apply a um, multi-proxy uh, approach in order to uh, describe as precisely as possible uh, the paleo-environments paleo uh, that followed the retreat of uh, Greenland ice in Nair Strait. The uh, data that I will be showing you today include sedimentological uh, proxies, uh, with, um, or data rather, with CT scans, grain size, and um, thin sections that I will be showing you um, shortly. Foraminiferal counts, um, semi-quantitative elemental composition from XRF core scanning. So here we have plotted the bromine on iodine ratio, which we use as a uh, bottom water uh, ventilation proxy, and seasonal sea ice <laughs> biomarker, IP25. So um, our records enable us to uh, describe our sedimentary succession, succession in terms of four time periods, which are each interpreted as being distinct paleo environments. So if we start with interval one, the interpretation of this interval was based mainly on sedimentological data. And the thin sections shown here illustrate the growing distance of uh, the retreating ice sheets to our core site. The record begins with marginal to glacioproximal uh, sedimentation, and above this subunit, uh, the sediment uh, is more typical of a more uh, glacial distal uh, environment. The uh, radiocarbon dated shell in this interval suggests that most of the western part of Kane Basin was ice free by uh, 9.3 calendar K before present. So this is illustrated here. And if we move up to interval two, the high bromine on iodine uh, ratio uh, combined with relatively low uh, IP25 suggests that the input of meltwater from the retreating um, ice sheets uh, led to a state of perennial sea ice uh, throughout interval two. Now, further retreat of Greenland ice in Kennedy Channel finally um, open the strait completely, establishing this connection between the Arctic Ocean and Baffin Bay. 
This event is marked by a nice, rafted, debris-rich interval in our core, which is dated at approximately 8.6 calendar years, kilo years before present. So following the um, final opening of the strait, secondary productivity is increased as nutrient-rich Pacific waters enter the strait from the north. And from 7.5 calendar kilo years uh, before present onwards, a more modern-like sea ice regime uh, was established with a long season of uh, sea ice cover and short summer melts of this sea ice. So this happened as the strait underwent uh, the post-glacial isostatic rebound, which is illustrated by the decrease in the planktic to bantic foraminiferal um, ratio. So the very recently completed bentic forum assemblages confirm uh, the succession of very distinct paleo environments in the strait uh, following ice sheet retreat. And we have um, planned uh, some work with uh, INSTAR at the University of Colorado to try and measure uh, trace elements in planktic and bentic forums in order to hopefully uh, trace, uh, sorry, identify uh, the water masses, their nature, and their sources throughout the Holocene. So um, I hope that I've convinced you throughout my talk that uh, our record is truly unique in that it does contain a continuous uh, Holocene record and that our multi-proxy approach was very efficient in uh, describing precisely the paleo environments uh, throughout the Holocene in the Strait. And during the next three years, all my efforts will be uh, concentrated on completing the examination of core cane 2B and investigating uh, the new cores from the north and the south of the Strait. So I am looking forward to comparing our results to um, other studies in the region. And uh, I will be following any new updates on the 2015 Odin cruise in the Peterman Fjord. And of course, I will be listening to the next talk with um, great attention, uh, since the Agassiz Ice Core will be a key archive uh, to compare our data with. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this nice presentation. Um, I have a question relating, um, related to the sedimentation rate in your core that you presented. It seems that the sedimentation rates are higher when uh, it's highest covered, and the, last, the, the second part of the, of the upper part of the, of the core covers a longer time period. So sedimentation rate seems to have decreased. So can you explain that? Uh, proximal, uh, glacier proximal um, environment. So the ice sheets will be bringing a lot of terrigenous material. So, and this will happen all throughout this first half where the, where the strait is still closed and ice sheets are relatively close to our core site. And then th 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 there'll be no comparison compared to the, the type of sedimentation here, which incorporates less terrigenous input from the ice sheets. When it was cored, did they hit till, or did, yeah. or well, is it just did it end? I wasn't there when it was taken, but um, apparently, it. We we do have the um, the seismogenic. Uh, no, not the. Sorry. Yeah, the the the, the seismograph of oh, the, 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 the the seismic. Thank you. Yep. Um, so yeah, so it, it it does seem that there was till at the bottom, and that's why the the course uh, stopped, and. This, this is so glacial proximal that we, we assume that we are very close to the ice sheet at the bottom of the, of the core, yeah. Can you explain the bromine-iodine um, ratio, uh, the argument in favor of using that for ventilation? Um, so uh, bromine associates, bromine and iodine associate with um, marine organic matter. Um, but in reduced conditions, iodine seems to um, unbound from the organic matter in the sediment. Um, so the higher the ratio is, 
the less oxygenated the waters are at the bottom. All right, so I'll be talking about the High Arctic, specifically the Agassiz ice cap, which is about uh, 80 degrees north, and its implication on the evolution of the Greenland ice sheet, more specifically, uh, the northern part of the ice sheet. And just before I get started, I want to thank my, uh, my co-authors, since without their help, I wouldn't have been able to do this work. So for a quick motivation, uh, it's quite important to try to characterize polar amplification of climate change in the past and present, and having a record which is relatively high resolution, which spans these timescales is quite necessary. In addition to having records that are spatially distributed across the, uh, the high Arctic, spe specifically because of the Holocene Thermal Maximum, which is quite spatially variable in space and in time and in magnitude. So we're interested in this past warm period, the Holocene Thermal Maximum, its sensitivity of climate change uh, to this warm episode. Um, and specifically, what we're interested in is the Axie ice cap, which is right here, more or less. And it's the most northerly high resolution record of uh, temperature change. And we've taken a shallow ice core, which has extended the record to present, because previously it was drilled in the 70s. And uh, we've corrected the, uh, the record for a number of first and second order processes to try to get at a more robust temperature reconstruction. So now I'm going to go through the methodology of how we, uh, we did this work, or actually in reality, how we kind of stumbled into it. And it all started with um, the Bo Vinther et al. 2009 paper on the Holocene thinning of the Greenland ice sheet. So they reconstructed the, the thinning histories at Camp Century and Grip, Grip and Die 3. And this was done using um, some special, well, they realized some special characteristics from the Renland Agassiz ice cap that if you isolate for the, uh, remove the ice static response at these sites, you could get a relatively clean climactic signal, which you can then isolate the uh, thinning histories at these other ice core sites. And this is what you end, uh, end up with. And that's our main result. Where you see, I like to point out uh, Camp Century, which thinned on the order of about you know, 500, 600 meters over the course of the Holocene. So we were in, interested in retacking this, uh, this, uh, this question of how robust were these isostatic corrections? And what we did is, in the uh, original study, they just used relative sea level and extrapolated back in time. But as we know, relative sea level and bedrock don't actually track each other. So what we did is that we calibrated a glacial isostatic adjustment model of sea level change to a number of relative sea level observations around Ellesmere Island. And we obtained um, a bounded region, essentially, between A and B right here. Uh, which is the most likely moisture pathways at which the moisture goes towards uh, Ellesmere Island and faces the first major topographical feature which elevates the moisture on which it goes, undergoes orographic precipitation at which it no longer gets elevated and makes its way to the Agassiz ice cap. And so here you can see these, uh, the bounds of these, uh, these two sites here. And then we revised the thinning curves uh, where the black ones are the original and the colored ones are the new ones. However, if you notice here, these are actually only go back to 8,000 years before present, while the original went back to the early Holocene. And that's because during the study, we realized that there were other processes which were really important at the southeast coastal part of Ellesmere Island, which affected uh, elevation changes, specifically the thinning of the Inuitian ice sheet. So this is actually what we uh, did next. Uh, so here you have the Agassiz Delatino record extended to uh, present. Here's the uh, isostatic rebound correction that we applied from, that I just showed. And here's the thinning of the Inuitian ice sheet based on a high variance subset of a Bayesian calibration of the North American ice complex by Tarasov et al. 2012. And uh, using some Delatino uh, transfer functions and these corrections, we came up with this Agassi temperature reconstruction. But what's important to be uh, said about this is that this is relative to a fixed elevation through time. This is not tracking a surface. And this is relative to pre-industrial values. Uh, we did something quite similar for the melt record at the site. Uh, here you have it, and corrected for isostatic rebound at the borehole site, thinning of the Inuitian ice sheet, and here you have a uh, summer temperature reconstruction where we used a transfer function for, uh, based on shallow ice cores to relate melt percent to summer temperatures. However, there's quite an issue with this record, which is beyond 100% melt and below 0% melt, there's no signal. So that speaks for the limitations of this. But it's been an outstanding issue because the melt record, which is shown right here, and here's the temperature reconstruction, they actually um, suggest a very similar timing in terms of the Holocene thermal maximum. Previously, the Agassiz ice core would suggest a Holocene thermal maximum at around 
uh, 8,000 years before present, not very pronounced and quite broad and uh, over several thousand years. And what we found with this uh, temperature reconstruction is that uh, peak temperatures occurred at around 10,000 years before present at around 6.1 degrees Celsius, uh, but given to um, two sigma uncertainties, you've got something more along the lines of 4.3 to 8.3 relative to pre-industrial values. Um, in addition to this, we found that present day temperatures were about four degrees warmer relative to pre-industrial values, and that present day temperatures are at their warmest actually in about 6.8 to 7.8 thousand years. And we looked at a number of other proxies to see if we see this early Holocene peaks. And when you look at the high Arctic, there are a number of sites which suggest this. Uh, other than, uh, obviously, uh, insulation at 80 degrees north, you also have pollen records which show this, uh, this, this peak during the early Holocene, which uh, speaks for atmospheric and vigorousness. Also, there's a peak in uh, whalebone remains in the, in the uh, Arctic, in the Canadian Arctic specifically, which uh, speak for a minimum in sea ice extent. So after this, we were interested in looking at the rates of temperature change, specifically. So here you have in black, a uh, Gaussian low-pass filter applied to the record. And here's a, in the inset, you have the last 600 years, where you have a piecewise re uh, regression done on this data. And what we found is that the present-day rates of temperature change are greater than about 1.5 degrees Celsius per century, um, which is actually compares quite well to observation, which is about 0.1 degrees per decade and that these rates of temperature change are at their highest uh, since the glacial interglacial trans, uh, transition. So this is relatively unprecedented over the Holocene. So the obvious next question for me was using the tools at my disposal, I was, I was interested in applying this revised climate forcing into an ice sheet model because the climate forcing is by far the largest source of uncertainty in, pa in paleo ice sheet reconstructions. And so I used a glaciological model, a reconstruction of the Greenland ice sheet, uh, termed the Hoi 3 Greenland chronology, which is a model that's constrained by relative sea level observations, ice extent, and elevation. And we conducted a, a simple climate forcing sensitivity analysis. So we parameterized the climate forcing using empirical equations. So here you have the actual record in red, and you have the Hoyt 3 climate forcing at Camp Century. So here we assume the validity of this climate forcing to large sections of, uh, of North Greenland. But that's obviously not likely entirely valid, but this is a sensitivity analysis, and what I really want to emphasize is the need to properly represent degrees of freedom in the climate forcing that's prescribed within climate models, because this can lead to a really large range of responses of the ice sheet. But here you have the Hoi 3 Camp Century climate forcing uh, in da dash black, and the revised is the black one right here, which is the best fitting uh, reconstruction uh, from the sensitivity analysis. And this was compared to relative sea level observations in North Greenland, and also elastic corrected GPS uh, rates across the region as well. And you see an, an improved fit with a, a few remaining uh, data model misfits, which uh, I can't quite get into right now, but the paper should be up pretty soon, so you could take a look at that all you want. <laughs> um, and something else we did is, uh, assuming the validity of the climate forcing to uh, uh, a broader region, we were able to reconstruct the Holocene thinning curve for Camp Century now, because previously it was truncated at 8,000 years before present. Blue is the Winter et al. Uh, thinning curve, orange is the revised one. So you have very dramatic thinning of 700 to about 1,200 meters. Quite a large uncertainties, obviously, and this comes with the assumption of the validity of the Agassiz temperature reconstruction at Camp Century, which can easily be questioned, but that's uh, an obvious caveat of this work. But upon prescribing this, uh, this climate forcing within the ice sheet model, you find this much more aggressive uh, thinning of the ice sheet kind of compared to previous studies which were incapable of actually reproducing these features. So obviously, if you had to thin more dramatically, the ice sheet had to be larger at the last glacial maximum. And by larger, I mean the last glacial maximum was about one meter equivalent sea level larger than we previously thought. Here you can see the dashed line is the Hoi 3 model. The black line is the one with the revised climate forcing, where the difference between those two are mostly reflected by changes in North Greenland. We were also interested in looking at the response of the ice sheet to the Holocene thermal maximum, and we found that in North Greenland, the ice sheet retreated by 20 to 80 kilometers, and this led to a deficit volume of about 18 centimeters equivalent sea level, which takes the Greenland total to 34 centimeters equivalent sea level. We're also interested in that Greenland mass loss during this period of peak warmth. Um, here you have a mass balance. Here is a contemporary mass balance estimates based on geodetic inferences by Shepard et al. 2012. 
And here at about 10,000 years ago, you have about 1,000 gigatons per year of mass loss, uh, which is about five to six times, uh, well, uh, five to seven times uh, greater than contemporary estimates, given uncertainties. So I'm just going to end by reiterating some of the key uh, results, specifically that temperatures were 4.3 to 8.3 degrees uh, higher relative to uh, pre-industrial values at 10,000 years before present at this high latitude site. And that present day temperatures are at their warmest in approximately 7,000 years. And that present day rates of temperature change are at their highest since the last glacial interglacial transition. And in terms of the modeling results, the Greenland ice sheet was about six meters equivalent sea level greater at the last glacial maximum, as supported by a number of uh, observational constraints. And that the Greenland negative mass balance during this peak warmth period was about 1,000 gigatons per year, which is five, five times more than what we're seeing right now. And I'll just end on the, this note saying that this paper is actually in, uh, in press in, uh, in PNAS, and it's actually coming out in exactly 10 days. So if you want to learn more about this, I invite you to go check it out. Th thank you. I'm guessing with Dyke on there, Art on there, you probably have done this, but have you been looking at all at the, um, at the um, whale bones coming out of, say, Melville Butte and so on and their timing? Yeah, ex exactly. Like, uh, like all the constraints we can get on ice extent and past sea level we'll go to back towards the model calibration, which can then uh, uh, reinforce the climate forcing uh, that we've reconstructed or actually the ice chronology and sea level. So it's all quite valuable. And there's also driftwood on the north coast of Ellesmere, too. At that yeah, time. We, we use this data to calibrate the, our glacial ice static adjustment model to get the uplift corrections. How, how does your, your um, results compare to like the Arctic-wide reconstructions that have been going on by Nick McKay yeah. and, and Jason Briner? I haven't compared those directly with that, um, but that's the obvious next step is to put it in the broader framework and and actually try to maybe fingerprint the Hollis Thermal Maximum more carefully and see if there's broader patterns or maybe if some of the, uh, the Delatino corrections that were applied in relationships, maybe they don't quite apply at such a high latitude. So, yeah. The, the really cool thing about the Agassiz record is it, re it has a record of uh, very early Holocene uh, maximum temperature. Mm. Um, and for almost the entire Canadian Arctic, there is no other record because it was covered with an ice sheet. And it's, it took a long, long time before I, the ice receded and you had lakes and you could build up a record that... So if you look at lakes, very often the so-called Holocene thermal maximum is 6,000 years ago, but of course it really wasn't that time. It was, it was when the, the, the radiation anomaly was at its max, which was about 10,000 years ago. And at that time, you had tree line in the Mackenzie Delta right up onto the, the uh, North American coast. Mm -hmm. So it really was exceptionally warm in what we think of as the you know, very, very beginning of the Holocene. Yeah, sure. But I have one, one question, if I could. At the end, you showed the growth of the Greenland ice sheet, the estimates mm -hmm. of the volume. And then you, it looks like it gets bigger in the last few thousand years. Yeah, new glacial regrowth. Um, and I know that there are um, uh, Paleo-Eskimo sites and Viking sites in, along the coast that have been submerged. And I wonder if there's widespread evidence for um, transgressions as a result of a, gr the, a larger ice sheet in the last few thousand years. You do see it in some of the salt marsh records and uh, relative sea level records around the, uh, the ice sheet. Um, well that's as suggested as the regrowth of the ice. But if you look at GPS observations, which suggest really rapid rates, you, it's hard to reconcile some of these two sets of observations. But obviously, it's, it's something that's occurred.